And so throughout the colonies, many of the colonies had an established church. A lot of the southern colonies, it was the, uh, the Church of England. In um, New England, it was the Congregationalist Church, or the, the Puritans, or the heirs of the Puritans, we should say, um, but it was referred to as the Congregational Church. Uh, the Puritans, they think, did they come from the Church of England? They had broken off, off, off the off. Church of England, um, but had, had, in New England had set up kind of their own. So the, the official church is the church that had been set up by the Puritans, known as the Congregational Church. Okay, so in New England, Massachusetts, for example. Um, in the middle colonies, you don't have as many established churches, like in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. Um, you don't have established churches. There's more religious freedom in some of those middle colonies. But you have a lot of Presbyterians there as well. So you have these small minorities that are dominating public life because you have to be a church member in order to be a member of the government or to vote. Um, and so the memory of this time period is, oh, well, you know, it's such a religious time period. Well, it was and it wasn't, right? I mean, people are participating in religion, but they're not church members. They're not living up to, to this. Um, and then in these established churches, you had to pay taxes to the established churches, whether you're a member of or not. So sociologists estimate that around 17% of colonists were church members. About how many? 17%. 17%. And they had to pay taxes whether they were members of the church. Yeah, and so if you were a Presbyterian in New England, you paid taxes to the Congregationalist Church even though you were Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. If you were a Baptist in Virginia, you paid taxes to the Anglican Church even though you were a Baptist. Um, and, and that's the that's the way it worked. Um, that was the law. Yeah, that was the law. Um, and so the, you know the politics of the time period. I mean, again, we're talking here before the revolution. Okay. But even after the revolution, uh, the state, uh, the the federal government kind of leaves that up to the states. And so the early state constitutions often had established churches. And it's not until the 1830s that a lot of those constitutions are rewritten where there isn't an established church. So there's still, that, that kind of holds over into the early republic period in the United States. So why was membership in churches so low? Well, we're not exactly sure, uh, but scholars have advanced a couple of theories as to the reasons for low church membership. Uh, and I think that this is part of the, the reason we should see kind of church membership at the end of the 18th century is important because I believe, I mean, we'll talk about what's known as the Second Great Awakening here in, in a minute. Uh, and so that becomes, but essentially it becomes this fertile field for religious voices to be heard, which I think is part of the reason why um, the Restorationist movement becomes pretty successful in the early 19th century is because of the way things have been developing in um, the United States up to this time. So anyway, why, why was church membership um, so low? Why do you see this decline? Well, there have been a couple of suggestions. First is um, that a lot of the colonies through the 18th century still tended to have um, a frontier-like experience where you have a lot of people moving around, there's not much order or institutions, and so you have churches in your major cities, uh, your coastal cities, but as you get out into, you know, you start moving west in some of these colonies, now again, remember, we're talking about the 13 colonies, so it's not very far west, uh, but you start moving west and people are spread out, there aren't very many institutions, including churches. So, you know, there, there's not as many people connected to churches because there's just so much space. Um, in addition, a lot of these frontier areas, the men outnumber the women, and traditionally, uh, you know, the women had been part of churches in higher number than men. I think that's even true today still. Um, and so you have lower membership numbers in places. 
um, very few ministers. And, though, and, and so you don't have a minister at that place that people can be drawn to, okay, here's a recognized religious leader. And sometimes those ministers that were there were rather ineffective because if you are um, paid by the state, your salary is paid by um, whatever uh, you know, the colony you're in, it's quite possible that a lot of the, uh, the, the, member, the ministers weren't that concerned about their members because they were taken care of by the state. And so the number of con the people that were in their church isn't that big of a deal because you're not getting paid by the members. You're, you know, and so you don't need a lot of members to make sure you're doing okay. Um, and so that might have been the case. Now you hope that there were quite a few ministers that would still have been, you know, it's still my calling, it's still my uh, responsibility to do that, but that might have been something as well. And, and kind of with that would have been the affluence that a lot of ministers had and the affluence that existed in uh, some of these more prominent cities. Often when people um, are experiencing great prosperity, great success, they, they don't find religion that important. And so towards the end of the 18th century in some of these major cities, there were a lot of people experiencing prosperity. And so that might have been a reason why they weren't as involved in religion. But then also, um, you have within the minister training programs of places like Yale and Harvard, um, increasing secularization, where there are clergy, right? there are ministers graduating these schools that have doubts about the supernatural. Well, I mean, you know, a very important point of Christianity is the existence, the reality, uh, and the activity of the supernatural. Uh, and so you have a lot of the clergy that are trained in these places um, that doubt the Trinity. They still believe in God, but they believe in God who is just God, that Jesus was just a good moral teacher, but not the Son of God in any sort of divine sense. Um, you know, and then they're going out and, and, and teaching this, and so, you know, that's not really connecting with a lot of people as well. Um, and so, all of these things might have worked together. And like I said, we don't know the exact reason, but, you know, these probably work together to um, decrease the interest of people in religion, especially as you get closer to the Revolutionary War and its, its aftermath. So a lot of attendance, it's required by law, but uh, you know, not that commitment, not that um, you know, wanting to be a church member, um, you, know, you don't see that as much um, toward the end of the 18th century. So just very quick, so the, so the, men, the preachers that were preaching that Jesus was not the Son of God, was that not just secular, secular relations? Yeah, yeah, so they're becoming very secular minded, they're becoming very uh, liberal in their theology, In the midst of all, in the midst of all of this, of course, as we get toward the end of the 18th century, is the Revolutionary War. And with the Revolutionary War, there are some important changes that take place. That again, we're, we're kind of setting the stage, or so I'm trying to kind of set out the American situation here uh, at the end of the 19th century, or excuse me, the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. So there are still, in some ways, those fears of Catholicism. So uh, the Seven Years' War takes place, or the French and Indian War, uh, as it's called. Uh, and the end of that is the signing of the Quebec Act. And the French and Indian War at the first, the first revolution. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's towards the it's, uh, 1763. Is when it ends. No, 17. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this date. Yeah, I want to say 1763 or somewhere like that. Yeah. Um, and. 
the Quebec Act uh, comes after that, right? So in the end of the French and Indian War, Britain gets control of, of Canada. Well, a lot of people in Canada have been French Catholics. But now they're under control of Britain, which is Protestant. So eventually the Quebec Act is signed to try and provide protection for those French Canadians who are concerned about um, you know, swearing uh, loyalty to the king. So they can't hold uh, public office as long as they're um, uh, as long as they are Catholic. There's other things that they can't do because they're Catholic. So as tensions start to develop between Britain and the colonies, they're concerned that the Canadians are going to support the colonies, and so the Quebec Act is signed, which essentially gives uh, some freedoms to Catholics in Canada including the free practice of religion, uh, the re removal of the emphasis of the Protestant faith and the oath of allegiance, and then also changes the borders of Quebec, so it, it goes further down into the colonial area. Well, this is a real big concern for the Protestants and the colonies because essentially it looks like the British monarchy is maybe siding with Catholics to some extent, and what will that mean? And so instead of preventing war, it actually is one of the acts that becomes uh, a push towards war. So the Quebec Act uh, kind of foments this rebellion, this concern, this need to have the emphasis on Protestantism. The Revolutionary War was a political event. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, I mean, it, just like anything in this time period, it's important to see Christianity as part of this. So Christianity um, is intertwined with the politics of revolution. So as people start talking about revolution, of course, there is this division that takes place between loyalists and patriots. Um, a lot of the loyalists tend to be members of the Church of England, uh, and specifically the Anglican clergy, because they are so tied to the, the church, which is tied to the state. There is also uh, several Christians who are preaching, uh, you know, ministers who are preaching for um, revolution, and preaching for freedom from the colonies, and so Christianity is tied up in this, even though, uh, you know, it's, it's not the origins of the Revolutionary War is, is very much a part of it. After, uh, as part of the Revolution, we can see Christianity filtering in some of this, but also seeing some of those other elements as well. When Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, uh, he talks about divine providence, uh, he talks about God, uh, the Creator, uh, the laws of nature and nature's God, very generic types of references. Jefferson himself um, was probably more of a deist uh, in that he denied the divinity of Jesus, but he did refer to himself as a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, but he tended to downplay the supernatural. So another document that um, that Jefferson develops is the life and philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, but essentially is taking the Gospels and cutting out all the supernatural parts of it. So any reference to miracles, any reference to Jesus as divinity, and keeping what was left. Um, so the Declaration of Independence, which is heavily influenced by Locke, John Locke, who we talked about earlier, the consent of the government, the uh, consent of the governed, uh, the laws of nature, life, liberty. Um, these inalienable rights um, becomes a part of how a lot of Americans are thinking about religion, the origin of the government, uh, the origin of the United States. And again, you know, there's there's nothing in the Declaration. It's it's very generic in such a way that anybody, uh, an Orthodox Christian, a Unitarian, a Deist, uh, somebody influenced by the Enlightenment. Um, that they would have all agreed on those principles. He writes it in such a way where it's not, it, it doesn't have to be read to exploit that, right? So you're trying to convince all the colonists to rally around this. 
after the war, of course, uh, several years, um, in the first draft of um, an attempt to uh, pull uh, the country together, of course, the Articles of Confederation had specific references to God, to Christ. The Constitution, however, doesn't. But one of the things that, that becomes a question is, of course, this, you know, what is going to be the stance of this new government towards religion? So, one thing has to do with the question of an established church. Uh, another has to do with questions about um, officials, elected officials, and what does their religious background have to be. And so, first of all, you have the um, Article 6, which says there, are, there should be no religious tests for office in the federal government. Uh, state constitutions have that for a while, and so many state constitutions had that you had to be Protestant in order to be a, uh, a governmental official. Eventually those are all removed. But in the Constitution, there wasn't supposed to be a religious test. Then, of course, there's the First Amendment that uh, develops, uh, and in the, in the First Amendment, of course, there is the free exercise of religion clause, as well as the rejection of the establishment of religion. Now, of course, there have been a lot of court cases related to the First Amendment and, and the First Amendment, especially in religion. There are other parts of the First Amendment about freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, those kind of things. But this question of what is an establishment of religion, and the church, uh, the Congress can't promote a specific religion, but does that mean, you know, um, for example, there's the, the office of faith-based initiatives in, uh, in the federal government now. And is that an establishment of religion? Well, people that support that idea say no, because it is, it is not supporting a specific religion. It's not establishing any religion, but if you're a faith-based organization, there are ways that you can partner with the federal government. Um, when it comes to the free exercise of religion, how far does that extend? Right. What is considered an exercise of religion? So there have been a variety of court cases. But with that came a couple of different things that become very important for um, early United States citizens when it comes to religion. And uh, we'll pick up with those on Thursday, talk about some other things related to the American situation, and then start getting into uh, the history of the Restoration Movement, particularly with uh, Barton Stone. So don't forget that first reflection essay uh, due on Friday. Um, you don't have to complete it. You only have to do four out of the five. But if you want those extra points, you need to complete all five. So don't forget to complete that uh, this Friday.